Well, let's uh, open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7, and uh, I, I want to focus on verses 24 uh, through 29. Matthew 7, verses 24 through 29. Jesus is concluding the Sermon on the Mount, and he concludes it with some very important and key words. Verse 24, he says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Would you bow together with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we do come to you today, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity of this day. And we come to this day, Lord, mindful, as perhaps we should in all days, that without you, it is impossible for us to live it to its fullest potential. And so, Lord, we come today asking for your strength, for your might, for your guidance, for your direction, as we seek to live this day, and also as we seek to honor you in this service. We pray today, Father, for the presence of your Spirit to be real in all our lives. Lord, speak to us through your word, through your spirit speaking. Lord, speak to us and may we be ever mindful of your voice. May our lives be different because of it. May our way be better and may others be influenced for the kingdom because of how we live for you. Lord, we come today to lift up those that are on our prayer list, those that are hurting, those that have deep needs in their lives. We pray for Robert Bowman today, Lord. We pray uh, that you will just bring healing uh, to him. We pray, Father, for uh, John, and we pray for Jackson, we pray for those that are having surgery. Lord, we lift them up to you today, and we, we just ask God that, that in the course of this next week, that your hand would be seen in the lives of these that are experiencing surgery this next week. Father, we pray for positive results for them. We pray for you to guide doctors and physicians and surgeons as they perform surgeries. We know, Lord, that you guide all things. Your hand rests on it all. And we pray for that in a powerful way in this next week for these that have been mentioned here today. Father, we uh, thank you for family and we pray that today the results of our worship and study will strengthen us and enable us to strengthen our families. Father, we pray for that across our nation today. We are a nation drifting in so many ways in the wrong direction. And we pray, Father, for leaders and leadership and people in places of influence that can help turn us to the right way, which is your way. Not my way or our way, it's your way. And help us to follow that way as we study and live by your scriptures. 
Thank you again for this church. Pray your blessings upon it. We pray for our Sunday school teachers and the preparation that they've made. And we pray for our Sunday school as it uh, takes place right after this service today. That you'd give us a good attendance, a good group of people digging deeper into the truths of Scripture that they might live fuller, obedient lives to you. Guide us through this day. Be honored by all we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you will, open your Bibles today to Matthew chapter 7. And we're looking at verses 24 through 29 today. We are in a series of messages. We'll bring that series to a close next Sunday. And the overall series has been the win. And we've been talking about how God wants us to win. Uh, we started off, uh, you know, looking at women that win on Mother's Day. And then we looked at servants that win, uh, believers that win. Today I want to focus on homes that win. And uh, next Sunday we're going to talk about men that win. In the Mother's Day message we had principles about how that, that, that if a woman applies them, she can win. But those principles also could apply to any of us. Next Sunday when we come to Father's Day, I'm going to preach on an interesting character in Scripture. I don't know if you know a man by the name of Shamgar or not. I don't know if you're very familiar with him. But after next Sunday, you'll know who Shamgar is. He's an interesting character in Scripture. There are only really about 22 or so words mentioned in the Bible about him. But in those words, we're going to learn how to win, whether it's a man or a woman or an individual in life. And so we'll finish this series looking at Shamgar next Sunday morning from the book of Judges chapter 3. Today though I want to focus on Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 29 as we think about homes that win. The story is told of a man who noticed one morning that he had a crack that was occurring in the sheetrock on the wall in his den. He noticed uh, after a few days that that crack just continued to increase and so he called uh, a painter and the painter came in, looked at the crack on the wall, uh, sanded it out, mudded it back, sanded it back down and painted it over so it would match the rest of the interior in the house and left. Over a period of time, the man noticed that the crack that had been on the wall in his den was reoccurring. It was coming back. He thought his painter had not done a very good job, so he called him back. He sanded it back down, muddied it, sanded it out, painted it again. Over a period of time, he noticed one morning that the crack that had been on the wall in his den was coming back. Except this time it had brought all its relatives with it in the form of other cracks that were occurring on the wall in his den. Frustrated with the painter that he had had in to do the work, he called another painter in. The guy came in, looked at uh, the cracks on the wall in his den, studied the situation for a few minutes and turned to him and said, I can't help you. And the guy said, uh, wait, 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 wait just a minute now. What, 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 what do you mean you can't, you can't help me? He said, I can't help you. He said, the problem that you have is not with the cracks on the wall in your den. He said, now wait, wait, wait a minute. I see a crack on the wall. You see a crack on the wall. I just need you to fix the cracks on the wall in my den. He said, oh, I see a crack on the wall and I can fix the cracks on the wall. But the problem you have is not the cracks on the wall. The problem you have is a much deeper problem you have a foundation problem under your house that is shifting. I suggest to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that cracks are showing up everywhere in America. They are showing up in our lives. They are showing up in our families. They are showing up in our children. They are showing up in our cities. They are showing up in our political system. Cracks are showing up everywhere. 
And the sad thing is that we spend enormous amounts of time, energy, and money patching the cracks on the wall, not realizing that we have a problem that's deeper than that. It's a foundation issue. We have a foundation that's shifting in America today. I think that's the reason Jesus taught us this passage of Scripture. I think it's the reason Jesus concluded this wonderful sermon that he has been preaching since chapter 5 in the way he did. We, we know that this is the magnificent sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's called that for a reason. If you'll turn back for a moment in your Bibles to chapter 5, verse 1, when Jesus began this magnificent sermon, it says in chapter 5, verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain... And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now I circled in my Bible the word, saying. Because from verse 3 all the way to the verse 29 of the 7th chapter, what we have are the sayings of Jesus. We have the words of Jesus. We have the message of Jesus. We have the sermon of Jesus. Now I think everybody in the house today would, would, would agree with me that Jesus is the greatest preacher that ever lived. I mean, he's the only one who ever preached a perfect sermon. Uh, there were no flaws in any message that Jesus ever preached. And so these sayings are important sayings because they, because they fall from the lips of the perfect preacher. So he sits down on a mountain and he begins to teach them saying. And so from chapter 5 to chapter 7 we have these sayings of Jesus. And he was a, he was a masterful teacher. Jesus would use parables or a story. He would use an illustration of some form and he would attach to it a spiritual truth or meaning. For example, Jesus would see the birds fly over air and he would take that picture of the bird in describing how if the heavenly father had so much intense compassion about him that he cares for the tiny fowls in the air would he not care for you and I as his children or he would take the picture of a sheep one sheep not a whole bunch just one sheep that had lost its way and how the how the shepherd would go out there and, and search for the one sheep and bring it back into the fold. He would teach with the use of pictures and illustrations. And he uses a magnificent illustration and picture in verses 24 to 29 when he uses the figure of a building project that is going on in the lives of two men. And I want us to examine this building project. You see... The whole key thought behind what Jesus was doing when he wrapped up the entire sermon, and he is in conclusion when he gets to verses 24 to 29, he's closing it down, he's tying everything together. Everything he said in his sermon, he's tying it all together now, and he's bringing the punchline for all of it. And he does it with a beautiful picture. Now, you'll notice that he says that what he's about to teach and wrap up and tie together is for everybody. You notice that? It's not just for a few people, it's for everybody. You'll notice in the text that Jesus said in verse 24, therefore, what's the word? Whoever. So this is a message for all of us. If you want to win in life, if you want to win in your family, if you want to experience a win, Jesus says, then you need to perk up your ears at what I'm about to say and the picture that I'm about to draw. It's for everybody. You see, here's the key thought. Homes that win are built on the solid foundation of God's Word. It's as simple as that. Homes that win, lives that win, people that really win, they build their life, they build their family, they build their existence on the solid foundation of God's Word. And so I want to dig into this story that Jesus told about the two builders today. 
And I want you to notice how to win according to these principles. First thing I noticed when I studied this story, and I've studied it a lot of times, is what I call the comparisons, the comparisons Jesus uh, pr provided. He provides for us some interesting comparisons. In a moment, we're going to see some contrast, but right now, I want you to just compare the two individuals. We have two individuals in this passage of Scripture. We have two men, we have two building programs going on, and there are some comparisons. I've never seen these comparisons all the years I've preached on this passage. And so I want to suggest three comparisons to you between the two men. I, I want to suggest, uh, first of all, as you look at these men, I want you to notice that, first of all, they had the same wish. They had the same wish. Isn't that interesting? Both men had the same wish. Notice what the Bible says in verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built, and what's the next two words? His house. So we have one man and he has a wish. He has a dream. He has a desire. And the wish and the dream, the desire, is to build his house. And then if you'll notice down in verse 26 it says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built, what? Same words, his house. So here are two different individuals. They have two different programs going on, but they have the same wish. Both individuals want to build their own house. Now, I, I never thought about it until I was studying it this week, but the word house is quite an interesting word, and literally it, it, it shows up in a lot of places in Scripture. Sometimes when the Bible refers to a house, it's referring to the building of a life. For example, it was interesting to me to discover in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 that uh, verse 4 talks about how Jesus is the living stone, and verse 5 talks about how we are living stones, and it says that we are being built up into a spiritual house. So life, building a life, is like building a house. We are a spiritual house. We are a habitation of God. The Holy Spirit of God lives and resides within us. Sometimes in the Bible, house can refer to the building of a life. Sometimes in the Bible, uh, the word house can refer to the building of a family. For example, we've all run into the phrase in Scripture that this is the house of David. And you'll see that passage of Scripture all throughout the Bible, that this house is referred to the house of, and it'll be a specific individual, and it has reference to the fact of the building of a family. Sometimes in the Bible, the word house can refer to the building of a ministry. In the Old Testament, Israel was called the house of God. In the New Testament, in Galatians 6, 10, you and I are called the household of faith. So sometimes a house can be referred to the building of a life. Sometimes it can refer to the building of a family. Sometimes it can refer to the building of a ministry. Sometimes in the Bible, house can refer to the building of a society or a nation. In Scripture, it is called the house of Israel. A nation was formed. You know what we call it today? The white house. Or we call it the house of Congress. Well, what is it? It's supposed to be an entity of people that have been placed by the people in a position of leadership in order to help carry out the nation in a well-organized and unified manner. I don't know if the White House or the House of Congress is reaching its goal or not. But that's what its intended purpose is to do. What person would not like to have a life that is 
that's uh, successful. What person would not like to have a family that is successful? What person would not like to have a ministry that is succeeding? And what person would not like to live in a society that is well-ordered and unified? Here are two men and they have the same wish. But I want you to notice, and these things are all important now, the comparisons, they had the same wish. Number two, they heard the same words. Isn't that interesting? Look at it. Verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to wise man. Verse 26, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, I will liken him to a foolish man. So we have two people. They are sitting on the same mountain. They are listening to the same words. They are hearing the same message. Now that tells me something. That tells me that, number one, a wise man can sit in church and hear the words. A foolish man can also sit in church and hear the same words. That's what that tells me. These men heard the same thing. They, uh, they were in the same service. They were listening to the same preacher, the perfect preacher. So this is an interesting comparison. They heard the same words. They had the same wish. And number three... They hit the same winds. They hit the same winds. They had the same storm. You will notice in verse 24 it says, or verse 25 it says, and the rain uh, descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house. You'll notice in verse 27 it says, the rain descended, the floods came and the wind blew and beat on the house. Isn't it interesting that the exact same words are used for both? individuals. See, a lot of times when we're going through misery, difficulty, trials, and troubles, we might get to feeling like we're the only one who've ever been there. We're the only one who've ever experienced. Listen, I want you to know, the rains fall on the just, the Bible says, and they fall on the unjust. Storms come to the righteous, and storms come to the unrighteous. Difficulties fall on the saved and difficulties fall on the unsaved. Why? Because we both still living in the same cursed world that's been uh, touched by sin. So nobody's going to get out of here unscathed. Nobody's going to get out of here without having some troubles and trials and some difficulties in life. And, and, and we're going to see in a minute that the difference is what you build on. The comparisons that Jesus provided. But that moves us secondly to the contrast. The contrast that Jesus presents. And he presents an interesting contrast. You'll notice it in verse 24. I circle the word, a wise man. Whoever hears these sayings of mine does them. I will liken him to a wise man. And then you look at verse 26 says, whoever hears these sayings and does not do them, I will liken him to a foolish man. There's the contrast. There were comparisons between the two. They, they had the same wish to build a house. They, they, had the same, they heard the same words, the words of Jesus. They get by the same winds, but that's as far as the comparison goes because now we get into a contrast and there is stark contrast between one who is wise and one who is foolish. Well, how do we know who is foolish and who is wise? And that's where the real heart of the story is. We, we discover who is foolish and who is wise by the foundation upon which their life their ministry, their family is resting on. And that's where Jesus gives you the story of the foundations. Let's look at the sandy one first. Down in verse 26 and 27, verse 26, the end of the verse says, He was a foolish man because he built his house on the sand. Now that's a shaky foundation. You know, let me tell you what, what 
just was impressed on me about the sand. Building on the sand. That's easier. That's quicker. That's cheaper. A lot of times we want easy. We want quick. We want cheap. You know, I, I, I'm amazed at people today. I, I really do. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Really, I don't, sometimes I don't know even what I am. But last Sunday, we had two units went out in the auditorium. And Lord have mercy, you, you would have thought we've never not been without air conditioning. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's hot. But look, I preached in July when it was hot. And these things, they didn't have. We rolled the windows up. And you, I, I, you could go home literally and take my socks off and wring water out of them. But hey, I was glad to be there. You know, we, we, we've gotten a little soft. Not only is that true physically, that's also true spiritually. We've gotten a little soft. And, and, and here's, a, here's a guy who wants the easy way, he wants the cheap way, uh, he wants the quick way. It's almost like what Jesus taught when he said in this same context of teaching, he said, you know, there, there are two ways, by the way. One's broad and one's wide and you're going to have plenty of friends on it and everybody's going in that direction and you, you, you know, it's just all going to be flowing like an interstate. But the other way, it's narrow. It's going to be a little more difficult for you to see. Not going to be quite as many people on it and the way is going to be a little tougher you know, one of the things that kind of irritated me a little bit, to be honest, when we were building that student center in Greenville, is we just kept bumping in to the building inspector and all them codes. And, uh, you know, we had about got the building completed. We were running behind schedule, trying to maneuver what to do with students, a growing student population trying to get them into, but they wouldn't give us an occupy for the building. Because one little old door hadn't had all the fire apparatus put on it. See, it wasn't until later that the Lord revealed to me the reason the codes are there is so that it doesn't cost you in the long run. And God has established in His Word various codes. He has laid specific guidelines down. Sometimes we want to go around them. Sometimes we want to go over them. Sometimes we want to ignore them. Sometimes we just simply don't want to do them. But they are there so that it doesn't cost us in the long run. We wind up building a building on a shaky foundation that one day is going to come crumbling down. He talks about a shaky foundation. We have Christians who are building on shaky foundations, by the way. It's not just a message for lost people. It's not just a message for that. Uh, Jesus sat down in a crowd with his disciples, I believe the text said. And we've got Christians who are building on shaky foundations. You see it, I see it. I see them. More interested in the secular than they are the spiritual. I see them. I see them more interested in what Hollywood thinks than what Holy Word teaches. I see them. I see them. I see them in church on Sunday and in the clubs on Saturday. I see them. I see them. I see them praying on Sunday and partying on the weekend. I see them. I see them. I, I, I see them singing the songs of Zion on Sunday and singing the old song of the world on Monday. That's shaky ground. It's a shaky foundation. I don't know if any of you are aware of, maybe you've even visited a little place called Pisa, Italy. Now Pisa, there ain't much there. They just got one big attraction. It's a tower. And it's leaning. It's called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Do you know why the tower in Pisa is leaning? Well, because it's in Pisa. 
Do you know what the word Pisa means? Marshy land. So why would you build a 183 foot tower on marshy land? You're building on shaky ground. Why would a person want to build their life on shaky ground and wind up being a tourist attraction rather than being a committed believer of Jesus Christ? He talks about a shaky foundation and then he moves to the solid foundation. You notice that foundation up in verse 4 when he talks about here's the builder who hears these sayings, he does them, he's a wise man because he builds his house on the rock. We have a solid foundation. Really, it's really, this is really an interesting word. Literally, it's the Greek word Petra. Same word Jesus used when he talked about building the church. Petra. Me. The rock. The rock of ages. We sang about it. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the what? All of the ground is what? It's shifting sand. Where do you think the writer of the hymn got his inspiration? <laughs> he got it right out of this text that we're studying this morning. A solid foundation, the contrast. Then Jesus draws some conclusions. I want you to notice the conclusions that Jesus proclaims. Now this is really important now. He's used this physical picture. He gets this physical image in your mind of a builder, two builders, and a building program going up. He wants that in your mind. Now he's fixing to drive home the conclusion. And you notice the conclusion comes in the first part of the phrase that references both these people. Notice verse 24. Therefore, whoever, 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 whoever what? Whoever hears, hears what? These sayings of mine. And, and, and what? And does them. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. So that tells me something too. That tells me that, that a wise man can hear the sayings of Jesus. It tells me that a foolish man can hear the sayings of Jesus. But notice the thing that makes the difference is one does them, and the other does not do them. See, let me give you a principle. Only when the word is applied will the word work. Now, don't you think about it. Only when the word is applied will the word work. Let me put it another way. Only when the Bible is applied to your life, will it work? You see, here's the thing. Both men had the same information. We would say, today, both men had the architectural drawings. One man side decided, I'll follow these drawings. The other man said, no, I don't believe I will. Now, one man, is the way I put it, one man listened and he responded positively. He listened, he responded positively, he did what Jesus said. That man is the one who's called a wise man. Now the second man, in verse 26, he listens, because both of them heard the same words, he listens but he, watch this, he rejects passively. One man listened, responded positively. Yes, I'll follow the blueprint. The other man listened and he rejects passively. He just passively turns it off. He just passively says, not going to do that. You see, you can come to church and agree with everything that's said and walk out a foolish person. You can even come to church and say amen and walk out a foolish person. You can come to church and memorize the text so that you could quote it on the street tomorrow, but ladies and gentlemen, the difference in how you build your life 
is not on how much information you can quote, but how much of that information I see you living out on an everyday basis in the world out there. Because listen, here's what happened. A storm came. And it's when the storm came that we find out the difference in the two houses. Sometimes Jesus will let a storm come so that you can figure out what you're really resting on. Whether it's you, yourself, or it's Him and His Word. The foundation of the two houses were revealed by the storm. One man walked away and did what Jesus said. The other man walked away and passively pushed it aside and did not respond. And the results is, his house fell. And the text says, great was the fall. Now I guess you could say that, well he built that thing way on up there, and he didn't dig way down here, and so when it did fall it made a big noise, and it was a terrible pile of junk out there. But I think that God revealed to me that it goes a little further than just the physical thoughts of a big crash. You see, when you and I, who name the name of Christ, who attend the house of God, who hold the Bible in our hands, who talk to people about coming to church and being involved and trusting God and all of that, if you and I don't build on the right foundation and we stumble up and fall, Great is going to be that fall because we represent something more than ourselves. You remember back uh, 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 2 Corinthians 2, 14, that passage we studied a few weeks ago, we, 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 we thank God who leads us in triumph in Christ that through us He might diffuse the knowledge of Himself in every place. We represent something that's higher than us. So if we stumble, great is the fall of that stumble. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, it's so important that you build your life on the solid foundation of my principles. And he had just given them those principles in chapters 5 through 7. You know, I'm a big Western fan. The old ones. I've got them recorded. My wife has them memorized. <laughs> I did a little research recently on Custer. General Armstrong Custer. The Battle of the Little Big Horn. Custer's biggest problem was Custer was himself. It was his pride. His arrogance. His unwillingness to not accept the facts and in some cases not even it take the advice of the high ranking people under him. And so on that fateful day, June 25th, 1876, he rode his 7th Cavalry of 265 men into the Little Bighorn area going to push a few Sioux Indians back to the reservation. And he ran into what he wasn't expecting. In a matter of an hour, those men were wiped out. Many of the bodies of the soldiers of the 7th Cavalry were mutilated. Scouts were taken, but Custer's body was left intact. Even as an enemy, they respected him. And his body was found with the flag of the 7th Cavalry flying over it. They did, however, do one thing to him. They pierced his ears with an arrow in hopes that in the next life, he would listen better and not make the same mistakes. 
I don't think piercing his ears helped him in the next life. You understand. But what I know is this. There will be some people in the next life if they don't change who will regret the mistakes of their lives. But the teaching of Scripture is every one of us in here today has an opportunity for that not to happen. You see, everyone has heard the words of this text. But what we do with them is yet to be seen. That's yet to be determined. Two groups always sit in the house on Sunday. Or I could, should say leave the house. Those who are wise and those who are foolish. And how do we eventually know the difference? Well, you know. You know by the actions of our lives. By whether or not we're doing what he asked us to do. The difference between the two men is what they did with the word of God. Would you bow together with me? In a few moments, we're going to have our invitation. We're going to stand and sing great old hymn about God's love, God's forgiveness, God being able to wash us clean from our sin. You're here today and God has spoken to your heart about a decision or a commitment for Him that you need to make. I'd encourage you in a moment to come and let me talk with you about it and pray with you. Maybe you're here today and who, uh, who, who of us doesn't want to build a strong life, a good family, doesn't want to have successful ministry and live in a well-ordered society. We all do. And all of us are a part of building that in some way or the other. And God wants to use us. And God wants us to know that He's set up principles that if we'll follow, we can win. But, but we must, we must follow His principles. We must be obedient. To his word to our life. And so maybe today, when we stand, it, it might not be that God's asked you to make a public decision, but it might be that privately where you stand, God is just nudging your heart, saying, I need you to follow a little closer, walk a little closer, believe me a little stronger. The principles, the sayings of mine. Father, guide us in this time of decision and invitation and use it to speak to all of our hearts that we might be strong towers, not leaning ones, for you because we are established on those solid principles of your word. May we build our lives that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of invitation today is 185, hymn 185, Whiter Than Snow. Great, great hymn. Would you stand together with me as you turn to that hymn and as we sing together our invitation song.